Um, if you would like to read along, I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11. 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11. <coughs> but if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was afflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote, that I may put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Thanks, brother. Good afternoon. From the moment I stepped down from my last sermon a year ago, I have been chomping at the bit to give this sermon. <laughs> In a way, it should have been the first sermon I gave because it means so much to me. The topic I want to speak about is forgiveness. And it got to where I was so excited, so into giving this yesterday. I was planning this, and I had all of these scriptures all together, and I was trying to place them, and I sat down, and I couldn't place them how I wanted to say it. So I would get up, and I'd start cleaning. And then I would think of something, and I'd go back and write it down. And then I'd get up and clean. So over the span of five hours, I cleaned the house great. You should see our house today. And I think Dana is probably going to encourage the elders to ask me to speak a lot more. <laughs> so what I've done is I, I grabbed a lot of scriptures and I had to purge some out. I had to plan exactly how I wanted to say this to keep it within the time. And I don't know how it's going to go within the time, but I'll do what I can to keep it there. It might end up faster than I thought. But I'm going to try to stay to my script as a much as I can here and not go off on a tangent like I often do. Forgiveness is such an easy thing to say. It's such an easy thing to, to think about and say, you know, if you've done something wrong to somebody, go and tell them you're sorry. Go ask them for forgiveness. Get it all straightened out. But forgiveness gets to be complicated sometimes. Forgiveness because it all boils down to our pride, it seems like to me. It gets to be difficult to do. And then you think that you've done it right, and if it's not accepted, then you wonder if you, there's something you could have done differently. Is there something I, I could have done? Sometimes with forgiveness, there's great victories. There are redemption. You can heal something that you just can't think that's possible to be healed. And sometimes you think something's easier to be healed, but it doesn't heal. And that was what was so confusing to me for a, a long time. And that's why I wanted to speak about forgiveness. Because as simple as forgiveness sounds, as simple as the concept is, the great example that we have of forgiveness, uh, which we have incredible examples of it, sometimes our pride gets in the way and the way it's received, or if we give it or we receive it, somehow it doesn't mesh and it doesn't work out between two people, then we think we're a failure. Maybe we didn't forgive. Maybe we hold bitterness. And so I want to speak today about forgiveness on how we deal with forgiveness with each other and why we need forgiveness and what the whole concept of forgiveness is. See here, I haven't even looked at my script yet. So. <laughs> I've had victories with forgiveness, great victories. I had defeats. There's things I don't know what happened because a lot of times we have to forgive people we'll never even meet. As strange as it sounds, you could get 
in some traffic altercation with someone who's in another car and you're angry. But you can forgive them and go on with your day. Never even will meet them necessarily. But you can still forgive and do your part. And that is what is important. Sometimes it doesn't end the way that it should. The way that it, it, it's a meant to be. There are some times, whether physical abuse could be one, mental abuse is another, lying, um, what else would I have? Toxic relationships. You have times where you can do what you can, you can forgive, but if you can't lead a life that a Christian should leave, you have to get away from that. If somebody just keeps abusing you physically, if you have a bully or something, you can forgive him in school, but you just have to stay away. And that gets where the line gets confusing to me, is what is our part? What do we have to do as Christians? We have to set an example, but how can we have forgiveness without healing? That's what I'm trying to say. Because we need to understand that you can have forgiveness without total healing here on earth. I'd like to start with our, our opening scripture about what forgiveness is and where its place is in the concept of how we are between us and God and us with other uh, people. Uh, turn, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Harper Study Bible subtitles this, The Law of Forgiveness. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one was brought to him who owned him 10,000 talents, and he could not pay. His Lord ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and besought him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave all that debt because you besought me. And should not you have the mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord delivered him to the jailers till she, he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. This is an obvious exaggeration of the amount of debt owed for a, a talent the Harper Bible study uh, has the, the talent as, uh, what does it say here? A talent was more than 15 years wages for a laborer. 15 years. One talent. A denarii, a denarius, was one day's wage for a laborer. The obvious comparison here is that we are not going to earn our salvation. We are not going to earn heaven by forgiving. There is no way that we can forgive someone as much as we have been forgiven. Such an important concept for Christians to understand. If we don't forgive, we're just totally denying the whole principle of forgiveness. What is forgiveness all about? So we can't think of, well, you know, boy, I did great. I forgave this person. I'm earning my way. This is my work. It doesn't work that way. 
Jesus died on the cross. He became the sacrifice for us. He gave us the example of forgiveness, the ultimate forgiveness. Nothing that we can do can compare to that. We are the ones who owe the 10,000 talents. We cannot forgive the people around us who may owe us a denarii or two, denarius or two. <laughs> so we have to learn that in our head, that we're not going to earn our salvation. Our salvation is from the grace of God. And there were a number of scriptures I had on that, but I kind of had to put those off to the side so I can get through all the other things that I wanted to say. The other thing about that is we have to understand there is sin. In school especially, you can get taught that there is no right, there is no wrong. It's just all what you think. What you think is right, what you think is wrong. They try to, to take what we would uh, understand the description of conscience and s extend that to where there actually is no right or wrong. Well, that's a whole other sermon I'd love to give sometime. But there is right, there is wrong, there is sin, and there is forgiveness because of that sin. Period. We know that Jesus died on the cross for us. An incredible act of forgiveness. As he's dying, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As these people are putting him to death, not in any normal way, a very long, agonizing, torturous death. And then we have Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verse 60. As he's being stoned to death, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. What incredible power those words are. What an example. Someone putting him to death, and he can say that. Lord, do not hold this sin against him. Years back, and this will age me because I remember it, there was a serial killer in New York City whose name was David Berkowitz. I don't know if anyone remember him. He was known as the Son of Sam. New York City was terrorized with what they called the Summer of Sam. It was, a, it was uh, of course, magnified because it was New York City. But he was a serial killer. And his method was to take a 44 Magnum and walk up to people sitting in cars at night and shoot them. It terrorized New York City for the better part of a year or more. When he was arrested, he had a, quite a story. He had stories of how the demons were in him and how people, other people were doing a lot of the killings. He had other people involved, which he later recanted and, and admitted that he had done all these things. But throughout his terror, he was writing letters taunting the police and which added, of course, to the terror that he was causing on the city of New York. The last victim that he killed was a young lady named Stacy. Stacy was shot, like the others in her, most of the others in her car, was she was with a friend. As Berkowitz was being sentenced, his plea deal, partly because they had engaged in an illegal search, but he had confessed so they didn't have to, to deal with it, he was given a life sentence in prison instead of the death penalty. Well, Stacy's mother was really pushing hard for him to be put to death. And that angered him. However twisted somebody's head can be, it angered him that the mother of the girl that he killed was pushing for him to be put to death. But he's getting sentenced to life. So as he's being sentenced, he taunts the mother of the last victim that he killed, saying a horrible thing over and over, audible. So much ruckus was created that they had to clear the courtroom adjourn. And of course, he just devastated the mother. This was back in 77, I believe is what it was. In 1987, David Berkowitz changed his life around and committed his life to Christ. I don't know what his doctrine is. I don't know anything other than his mind, what has changed. He began a ministry in prison, which is, they can't have a hierarchy, hierarchy in the prison for inmates, 
but he kind of officially is like the, the chaplain of the prisoners in the prison that he's in right now. Since 1987, he changed his life around, got to, to know a bunch of different people in, in prison, and he has gotten to the point now where he has a website which he cannot have anything to do with. He writes a journal down. Somebody will put it on, on the, the Internet. And he has an extended ministry. It's, it's quite amazing to, to see. That's its own story also. Yeah, if you want to see something interesting, look at what uh, David Berkowitz, he has a book out called Son of Sam, Son of Hope. He reaches out. What was amazing to me in that story was in 2006, Stacy's mother was dying, and she penned a letter to David Berkowitz forgiving him. And when I read that, it just, oh, it just still gives me the chills when I think of that. What she did in her heart, and of course she was right. She was saying to people, if you don't forgive, it burns you up. It's bitterness. And so she forgave him before she died. And there's a, just a number of testimonials to, to the ministry that, that is there. But uh, I want to look at one scripture that kind of coincides with that. And that's Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 16. Hebrews 12, 12 through 16. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with all men and for all with, for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fail to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one be immoral or irreligious like, like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Unforgiveness creates bitterness. Not only does it create division, which we can't have, amongst us, but it creates a bit bitterness that can get in there and destroy us personally. Many of the people that you forgive, or if you don't forgive, let's put it that way, if you don't forgive, understand whoever it is that wronged you, they left that behind the dust a long time ago. They're going on with their life. You're the one left with the bitterness if you don't forgive. And that's an important thing to do. What's the point of that? It was a part where I was confused for a little while. You know, where was I being bitter? Was I doing all I could? And I tell you right now, I don't have the answers. And there's a number of, of lessons to, to give on this. By the way, we've been studying this uh, lesson in Tuesday night men's class. So uh, if you've been to that, I know this is kind of redundant. And you're, you're going to recognize that I'm stealing a lot of Robert's uh, quotes <laughs> directly. <laughs> Forgiveness is needed because of sin. Plain and simple. Sin separates us from God. There's no way that we can get to heaven on our merits. We have sinned. We have to have the sacrifice for our sins, which we know is Jesus. If you read Psalms 51, verses 1 through 17, you see the agony that King David was in. King David saw a woman used his power to bring her to him. She's with child from him. He has her husband killed. And then it's found out and it's told directly to him by a prophet. Psalms 51 is the scriptures, the, the, the horrible torment that King David felt. How much guilt how much anguish he was in because of his sin, what he did. And you think about that. Think of, man, that was a really bad thing to do. What is King David, a man after God's own heart? It's like, wow. <laughs> there, is, there is redemption. God provides it for us. We know that the first example of that is in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. We have the example where they have sinned. And what did they do? They were ashamed. They hid. They tried to hide from God because they had sin and they were separated. They could feel it. I'd like to read uh, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. 
Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you so that he does not hear. This shows clearly that there is a separation when we sin. Sin separates us directly from God. And another one in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you he made alive when you were dead through the trespass and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of powers of the air. The spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. So we are all by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. In the same regard that we have the sin that separates us from God, forgiveness restores the relationship with God. In our Tuesday night men's class, Robert seems like his favorite saying is that forgiveness restores relationships. It's such a great theme. Once again, it's like forgiveness itself. It's an easy concept, but you start thinking about it, and it, and it, it gets deeper, and it gets uh, uh, more profound. I'd like to read uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Romans 5, 6 through 11. While we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Why, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man one will even dare to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We had the separation. Forgiveness gives us the restoration. We have it with God. The prodigal son, Luke 15. What I spoke on the last time I spoke. Here we have the lost son went out and spent the money foolishly. He comes home. He's got it all. He's feeding the pigs. He says, my dad's servants have it better than I do. I'm going to go back and, and just beg for forgiveness. He goes back, starts to beg for forgiveness, but the dad has none of it. Dad's already forgiven him. He don't even give me the speech. And... The restoration was right there. The Lord's Prayer teaches us that we forgive as we have been forgiven. Very important. That's important that we pray that too because we need help with forgiveness a lot of times. My, uh, it seems like I have to give testimonies anytime I speak nowadays. <laughs> the one episode of forgiveness that, that has eaten at me. And we need to understand that as humans, we don't forget. It's in our head. Whether we forgive or we've been forgiven. To me, it's, it's having been forgiven, and it still sticks in my head. God blots out our sins. But humans, we remember. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I don't think it is a bad thing. If somebody sins against you, you know how to help them later. You know how not to present a temptation in front of them later. It is a good thing that we don't forget in a lot of ways about, about forgiving. When my son, Mike, was 15 years old, I did a big boo-boo. He had a, a strained relationship with someone who needed physical needs, had physical needs, physical help. And he point blank asked me not to help this person. And I told him, okay, that was my mistake. Somehow I justified it in my head that if I was helping this person, well, I was okay. It doesn't matter whether or not he knows. It just doesn't hurt him. No problem. Well, that's a real big problem because from the time that boy was born, I was telling him the truth is the most important thing in your life. If you start telling lies, it's going to be like the adults on, on the Charlie Brown cartoons. You remember the adults and Charlie, wah, 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 wah. Who's going to listen? You don't even know what they're saying. If somebody won't tell you the truth, 
what difference does it make what they're saying? So I was trying to teach, teach my son that. I have a really funny story about that when he was a little kid, but I don't want to get into that. I helped the person that I told him I wouldn't. Instead of manning up and saying, son, I understand the hurt, and it may hurt you a little bit, but the right thing to do in this situation is to help this person. Don't you get it? I know my son in his heart would have said, okay, Dad, I'll put that aside. But I didn't. I helped this person for two weeks providing monetary aid. Well, he found out. Well, guess where his dad ranked? All of what I had told him, the most important thing of life, he turned around and saw me doing exactly the opposite. And it just burned me up because there was no reason for it. I had every reason to tell him that this was the right thing to do, to show him an example, and I messed up. It was very hard to face my son when I told him. It's still in my head, and I don't expect him to forget it. I hope that he uses a lesson on what not to do. But it's something that still gets me. And I still am sorry about that. I don't keep telling him I'm sorry. I don't keep asking him for forgiveness because there's no reason to. When you ask for forgiveness, if you're forgiven, done. There's no sense. Keep bringing it up. If it's done, it's done. And that's what we have to, to understand. How does forgiveness work between Christians? Boy, this is where we start stepping on toes real easy if we don't watch it. <laughs> I'm not preaching to anyone in general. I'm preaching to me, mainly. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. <laughs> 17 through 31. Now this I affirm and testify in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of uncleanliness. Cleanliness. You did not learn Christ that way, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put away the new nature created after the, put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may be able to give to those in need. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for edifying, as fits the occasion, that it may impart grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were, you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Pretty straightforward. There's a lot of other ones. So, if somebody wrongs us, what do we do? Do we just sulk about it? Do we tell other people, oh, you know what this person did to me? Do we sit around and wait for them to come to us? No way. Number one, they may not even know what they, that they did anything wrong. You know, personally, I like to joke around a lot, and, and I could probably easily offend somebody, and I wouldn't even know it. So if somebody sins against you, if you're offended, we should not just wait for it to, to, to come to us. You don't let it fester. A good, uh, good scripture on this would be Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. 
Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Man, I can't believe the time. Not even close. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two along with you that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Get the forgiving done. Wipe it off the table. Allow the healing to begin. As brothers and sisters, we don't we should not have this, well, I tried, you know, like, like we would do with the world where you do what you can. Yes, we do what we can, but as brothers and sisters, it's so important that we do get the actual healing. If we can't get the healing, keep trying till we can get a healing between, between two because we don't want any kind of divisiveness amongst us. I'm going to have to s- skip scriptures. We remember what TJ read for us earlier. We need to forgive because that person can be really overcome. They can have grief. They could have guilt. And what he's saying, that alone is enough. But forgive them and hold on to them. And he also says, if, if you forgive them, I forgive them. If I forgive them, you forgive them. When you have someone who's, or uh, brothers and sisters, someone who's in this healing process, it's so important to be encouraging You know, it's okay you say, well, you know, man, I could never forgive someone if they did that to me. Well, that really isn't edifying. (laughs) It's not what you need to hear right then. What you need to hear is, that's great. That is so awesome that you guys are healed. It's important, and I've been in this. If someone has forgiven someone for something that they did to them, what good is it going to do you not to forgive them? You weren't even the one wronged. If they have forgiven, you forgive. Period. Done with it. On we go with what else we have in life. Let's deal with the important things and not get hung up on someone else's healing. Don't get in the way of healing. Encourage it. Don't let wounds fester. I have that in capital. Repair relationships. Forgiveness is all about repairing relationships. It provides the environment. That's Robert saying over and over. Let's get back to the story of the lost son, the prodigal son. Who do you end up feeling sorry for at the end of that story? The older brother, right? And why is that? There's the older brother. You know, Dad, I did everything that you said all these years. No problem. Whatever you wanted, I did it. You give your other son, part of his inheritance, he goes and spends it on on harlots. He just totally takes your hard-earned money and just wastes it horribly. But look at me. And you want me to go in there and celebrate with you because you killed the fatted calf and you've got this big party and there's music. Oh, we're having a great time. It doesn't say the story stopped there. But think about that. Here he is. Here we are. Good Christians, we're doing what we're supposed to do, right? Other people are having that. What's the the one thing? I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these sinners. (laughs) What a horrible thing to say. Well, Robert also says, church isn't a resort for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. We aren't the perfect ones here today. We're the ones who need forgiveness. We need to learn to forgive. That's what we're about. We're not church people, good people. We're just trying to get to heaven. And we need each other to get to heaven. And if we have any kind of divisiveness, because one person is offended by another person, it needs to be cleaned off the board. Just get it out of the way. i gotta, I got to throw my poem in because I, I just think of this. Every time I think of this uppity Christians thing, when we're, we're looking down at people saying, I'm glad I'm not like you, the poem uh, called I Dream, 
I dreamed death came the other night, and heaven's gates swung wide. With kindly grace, an angel came and welcomed me inside. Well, there to my astonishment stood folks I'd known on earth, some I had judged and called unfit, and some of little worth. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free, for every face showed stunned surprise. No one expected me. That gets to me every time I think of that. We need to not be complacent. We need to be aware as much as we can of other people's feelings, other people's needs. We need to maintain the spirit of unity through the bond of peace. This is kind of a going joke. My family, I'm such a Teddy Roosevelt fan. I told my son today that I was bringing up to the pulpit two books, one the Bible and what's the other one? He said, something about hunting. And I said, no, and he said, something about Teddy Roosevelt. And I said, that's right. <laughs> I would like to read a quote from Teddy Roosevelt that inspires me to get where I am as a Christian and help us all to understand where we are as Christians. It wasn't meant to be that. He was talking about uppity journalists and people who always complained about people who were actually trying to make the world better. But it really affects us as Christians. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. Brothers and sisters, we're in the arena. That's us. We're together in this. Our faces can be marred with blood and sweat, tears. The relationships that we have together with love and forgiveness are what keep us in the arena together. The world could mock us. There's always critics. For whatever reason, boy, don't they love to point fingers when we fail. They use our failings as an excuse not to be Christians. And how much does that tear us up? We are together in our struggle to be good Christians, to be soldiers of Christ. The arena is the hardest place to be. It's so easy to stand outside and say, look at those Christians. I thought that was a Christian. The being the critic is the easy thing to do. But we have this arena together, and it's important that we have the unity, and forgiveness is such a major part of that unity. And I'd like to close in Colossians. I can't finish this lesson without reading Colossians 3. This is just a general exhortation to us on the Christian life. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
On the account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there cannot be Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds every together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to the God the Father through him. My challenge to you today is to look to see if we have forgiveness that we need to deal with amongst each other. If you have that, get that done. Get that taken care of. Either way, if you need to forgive, forgive. If you need forgive or need to tell somebody they, they need to forgive you, get to it. Get away all of any kind of divisiveness and be strong together as Christians. If it needs to be public, make it public. Whatever you need, come forward if you have any need that's public as we stand and sing.